of serving as the chair of this august body. The Historic Preservation Commission is a nine-member board appointed by the city council and serves on a voluntary basis without compensation. The purposes of the commission are to promote the educational, cultural, economic, and general welfare of the city through the preservation and protection of buildings, sites, structures, areas, and districts of historic significance and interest through the preservation and enhancement of local historic, architectural, archeological, and aesthetic heritage found in the city through the maintenance of the distinctive character of the city historic districts and through the promotion and enhancement of the city's historic and aesthetic attraction to tourists and visitors. I'd like to take this opportunity to ask the other members of the commission to introduce him or herself, and I'd like to start from my right and the audience left. Robert Hesse. Carol King. Dallas Hanbury. Camilla debard -Laven. James Long. <coughs> Michelle Browder. Thank you very much. And I'd like to encourage each other commissioner to speak directly into the microphone because our meetings are recorded. <clears throat> Excuse me. To our other commissioners you have in your package, the minutes of the June 14, 2022 meeting and the chair will now entertain a motion for the adoption of those minutes. I move that we adopt the minutes. Second. It's been moving properly. Second, that we adopt the minutes of the June 14, 2022 meeting. Is there any unreadiness? All those in favor, let it be known by a show of hands. Motion carried. Thank you so very much. We have an exciting agenda in place for us this afternoon, and we'd like to get busy. And our first order of business is a conference report from the National Alliance of Preservation Commission. Uh, Christy? It was a COVID super spreader event. Um, everybody <laughs> I know who went ended up sick. Um, so the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions is a national organization that services staff and boards like y'all. And you know, one of the things we talked about, one of, one of the things they do is the commissioner, Commission Assistance and Mentoring Program, which we've talked about to do training. Um, we just got the contract from the state for our grant application for that. So that will be coming up in the next year. That's kind of tangential, but it just happened uh, yesterday. Um, so NAPC is really the where the rubber hits the road um, conference. And there were a few things that I think are duplicable here. And also, you know, as, as you may not be surprised, um, sometimes recommendations that come from staff are not taken as seriously as recommendations from people outside because you all are, are the experts um, in this. So if there are things, you know, we've talked about an annual work plan. If there are things in here that you think are interesting or we could apply for grant funds for or need to lobby city council for a line item to fund, um, I just I want you to be thinking about those things um, as I go through some of, some of what I think you all might consider um, pursuing. Uh, I sent the link to the podcast, um, and I hope that, I know some of you had a chance to listen to them. The, the podcast is put together by a woman who works for the Cincinnati Preservation Association, and they have a staff of four, and they're a preservation nonprofit in, in Cincinnati. And we, we have had discussions with Troy Public Radio about um, podcasts, Sounds like Landmarks is getting ready to do some things. Um, you know, is there an opportunity? And I think Dal Dallas, you've done podcasts too, haven't you? In for, the past, we for, have for your collections. Um, whether or not there are kind of aspects of Montgomery's history, kind of untold histories, or you know, doing 20 minutes to talk about 
the different neighborhoods and who lived there and how they developed, I mean, could be a, a good starting point. Uh, that, that, that may be something we'd want to look at doing. You know, it would require some research and some script writing. Uh, but it's it's something that could put some of some maybe have a more publicly accessible outlet that younger people gravitate towards um, as something we might be able to do. And kind of the secondary piece of that, I think you all have one of these. The same group has done this sort of thing for endangered properties. And I think we looked before um, the city of Decatur, Alabama has done a, or no, Huntsville. Huntsville had done like a coloring book, activity book based on architecture. Um, they put out like coloring book images of buildings with information on the back and a QR code for endangered properties, landmarks that they wanted people to be aware of to save. Um, and I think I can't remember if they gave out two examples and I only took one and I can't remember if this is the one that got torn down or if it was the other one. Um, but again, we can get, we can apply for grant funds to develop an activity book about architecture, you know, get to know architecture in your neighborhood. We've talked about a coloring book um, that could go to elementary schools to teach them about the buildings they live among. So think about these as potential um, grant application opportunities because you know our, our budget cycle starts October 1 we have to start putting together budget numbers in March and April of next year to get that approved um, prior to the next fiscal year so we're really only six or seven months away from that process starting so uh, keep that in mind <clears throat> um, there were a number of cities, there was a session called Bucks for Bricks, <laughs> and unfortunately Bucks for Bricks was at the same time as How Beer Saved a Neighborhood, so I didn't get to go to the brewery, um, present, how brewery brought back a, a commercial neighborhood, but there are a couple of cities that have line items for uh, repairs and maintenance issues, and from what I understand, most of this is not CDBG, which is the traditional way these sorts of things have been funded, which means it's federal money, which means there are lots of strings attached. These are just general budget line items. But the one that was interesting, and it's interesting because we have started discussions on about what to do for the 60th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March in 2025. And one of the cities has a line item for what they call block work, where they will select a block and they will get volunteers and materials donated and they will go out one weekend and do a cleanup day, or, you know, maintenance and cleanup day. And they actually got a $100,000 grant from Lowe's to supplement that last year. And that is something that is, I think, could be potentially beneficial along Oak Street in particular in advance of that anniversary, that upcoming anniversary. And that is something that I would imagine the HPC could help spearhead as we uh, put on a public face for national media attention again. Um, There are some things that I'm that related to trades and, and ordinances and probably not really something for this <coughs> body to take up at this time. But I did also meet with um, Maurice Robinson yesterday at ASU and they are starting to offer public history offerings. Uh, at this point, it's mostly archival um, coursework but we talked about how we could incorporate <clears throat> preservation into that and possibly get students to help, um, you know, both teach them how the ARB process works, but even maybe get some interns <clears throat> to work with the HPC to come up with um, projects and activities that, 
this body could back based on that, that list of powers and duties that you all have. So that is, we just had that meeting yesterday. So again, it's, it's, it's one more thing that um, I'm hoping we can kind of, again, pull in younger people, broaden our reach in the community, and um, look for ways to, to work with some other organizations. I did go to a session on transitioning sacred places that was put on by the Partners for Sacred Places, which is how to, you know, dealing with congregations who no longer need all the space they have. Of course, we have the First Presbyterian issue that's still kind of lingering out there somewhere that will, I'm sure, come up again. Um, the old First Methodist Church on Dexter had an estate sale a few years ago or a few weeks ago um, so I don't know if it's likely Valiant Cross will take over that space I know the Methodist Church donated the church in my neighborhood and the outcome has not been particularly good um, for a designated building and this building downtown is designated as well so um, I think we need to also start thinking about you know what ways can we, you know, not just tell people they can't tear buildings down, but try to work with them to find solutions when you have a very, when you have a building that was constructed for a very specific use, and that use is no longer a viable option. Um, and I think that we, we're going to, as, as, you know, church trends are that congregations are shrinking on the whole. And I think we're going to see that. We, we've got a couple of older churches in Centennial Hill um, that I, I don't know what their status is, but I think that this is a place where we could really start looking at how can we assist people? How can we not just tell people no, but offer them alternatives or help them find alternative uses, um, owners, um, opportunities to fulfill their outreach mission in different ways, that sort of thing. It, it sounds like, you know, 10 years ago when churches called and said, do you know of any grant funds? The answer was just no, no, you know, because federal entities were not granting money to religious organizations, um, not without setting up separate foundations that care for the, you know, the building maintenance and that sort of thing. Um, that seems to be loosening a bit. Um, there are specific funds for churches through, uh, through, through the Partners for Sacred Places. The National Trust is offering funds to um, historic black churches. And it sounds like even the Park Service is, is kind of moving towards a recognizing that there's more to these buildings as part of a community than just their evangelical mission. So these, we, we've, we just went through the research our intern did on the, the institutions and businesses that were lost with the construction of the I-85, I-65 interchange this afternoon. And it's just a phenomenal number of like community institutions that were just wiped off the face of the earth. And those are, those are the things that glue communities together. And uh, I, I think there's an opportunity here as, as we, we try to help revive some of our, our neighborhoods to help folks find ways to make use of these buildings and not just see them torn down, burned down, um, whatever. So that's my soapbox for the afternoon. But th those are some of the things that I think translate <coughs> um, to the types of activities or awareness raising that the HPC could do. And I, I just wanted to plant those seeds while they were fairly fresh in my mind. Um, Any, and, the, and, and one, one thing that may end up coming up with the trail work too is one of the sessions was on accessible commemoration about sharing undertold stories. So that gets to the podcast 
um, we, we're looking at some ways to, to do some interp interpretation along the trail in particular that help tell some of this, the, 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 the lost history of, from our built environment and what that meant to the community. Um, so I think we, we've got some good ideas on how we can translate that into something physical. Uh, moving forward and if anyone's interested or wants to help or is interested we're, we, we also yesterday got the agreement for our National Park Service grant for this project um, so we're going to be moving forward with the oral history portion of it and if anyone's interested in doing an interview um, with one of the residents in that area in the next year or two let me know um, so, is that trail or surrounding the trail? Well, it's specifically um, wanting to talk to people about what the neighborhood was like before and after the interstate. So not necessarily oh, okay, not trail then. Not well, the trail runs through it. Right. right. But that's you know okay. it's our our desire is to kind of winnow out the what daily life was like. Because when you look at this list of businesses that were there, these people didn't have to leave the neighborhood. All of their daily needs were met within walking distance of where they lived. And the interstate wiped most of that out. Um, and the consequences have been, you know, kind of unfolding over decades of, of just how that unraveled that community. So it, it's really talking about what it was like to be able to walk down to the, the corner grocery or to go get the best bologna sandwich at, at this shop. Um, so that, that, those are the kinds of things that were, were kind of our starting points to talk about what neighbors did for one another and what they remember about, you know, maybe, maybe my mama didn't catch me doing something, but if old Miss so-and-so down the street caught me, she, she was going to whoop me like she was my mama, which is what, you know, Desmond Wilson tells us, that his mom didn't have to catch him because there were a bunch of people on his street when he lived on Grady Street that were going to make sure that <laughs> if his mom didn't see it, and they did, that something was going to happen. So, <clears throat> Comments? Questions? I have a question. <clears throat> grant money, mm -hmm. how plentiful is it for like elderly? Like when you're out making your rounds and you see a home that needs some work but it, elderly people are in there that can't afford it, rather than let that continue <coughs> to decline the property, is there a way that we can help them with grant money to, main, to bring it back, the maintenance level back up so that when they eventually do pass, their children just aren't letting the house sit and go into even further repair to the point where we lose a house. Um, that was one of the programs, one of the cities had did it with general funds and they, they use that as grant money. Um, let's see. Uh, one did a no interest loan for repairs and maintenance and they would loan up to $7,500 one for one match, so you had to match the money, and they had a $40,000 annual budget. Payoff was average four to six years or one property was sold, so it didn't have a set, uh, a sunset on the, on the loan. Mm -hmm. So more um, of like a lien on the house then? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's satis satisfied at the sale. Um, the, the city that had the block work was doing kind of what you're talking about, where they would, um, I think they were targeting a block, and that may just be based on the size and composition of their community, that that's what made sense to do. I know when I interned with the Columbia Development Corporation in Columbia, South Carolina, um, <clears throat> Most of what they did was commercial de development in the old warehouse district, but it was immediately adjacent to the governor's mansion. And then there was a park that's kind of up on a, it goes up a hill. And on top of that hill, there was a neighborhood called Arsenal Hill. And it wasn't very big, but 
you had a lot of long-term elderly residents, housing stock dated from, you know, the late 1880s to maybe 1920, so historic neighborhood. And what um, the CDC did was, <clears throat> in an effort to not gentrify those folks out, of course, property taxes are a lot higher in South Carolina than they are in Alabama, um, they started selling off some of the, the lots on the embankment that overlooked uh, the river and, and part of downtown for high-end construction, and they took a portion of the proceeds of the sales for those lots to fund a maintenance program for those residents um, where they would fix porch rails and they would paint the exterior of the house and they would make sure it had a good roof on it. You know, the things that help seal the building envelope. Right. Um, I mean, there was still an application process to it, but that was how they decided to fund a program like that to target um, those kind of issues, to try to retain the integrity of the neighborhood make sure that people weren't spending money they didn't have and, and try and try to help. I think they, they must have done some sort of like tax, property tax freeze on the property for a certain, usually about 10 year period to ensure that you don't get, you, that you can't afford to stay there anymore. Um, so there, there are ways to do it. Um, some of the CDBG funds have been, have been used in the past for like a home program for low income, maintenance, um, but I mean, Montgomery's big enough and we have enough low end or, you know, kind of, we have a lot of old housing stock that probably wouldn't appraise for very much where you couldn't go out and get a conventional loan. Even, right. even if you could afford it, your, your property wouldn't appraise high enough. Um, so there, there are ways to be creative about doing that and having to target it, I think, is, is the key. Well, you know, I either attend or watch the city council meetings and it seems like there's an increase of properties that are being destroyed um, because of the lack of maintenance on them and stuff and that they're condemning <coughs> all these homes. And it seems like it would be money well spent to throw a layer of paint on and you know perhaps a roof to preserve that property so that it doesn't decline like that. And then it benefits the rest of the neighborhood, obviously. And it, it's cheaper to rehab these old houses than to build new. Right. And you know when the city built. <clears throat> I think it was three houses behind Lanier High School as part mm -hmm. of that Lanier Place development. It was supposed to be affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, it was HUD money, so there were certain income thresholds that you couldn't, you had to be within a certain range. Um, but the cost of construction, it was $125 a square foot, mm. which, you know, may not sound bad. I'm renovating a house in my neighborhood. I'm hoping we'll get 80 a square foot. You know, and my neighborhood appraises higher than the properties behind Lanier High School. So, you know, there's there's kind of a disconnect on, you know, it's, it's the short-term solution. You've got blight. You've got people probably occupying properties that shouldn't be there. You have activity that people don't want. And the short-term solution is to knock the building down. So you just, you, but then you start eroding the fabric. You haven't solved the problem. The problem moves to the next right. vacant property, and the cycle starts over again. So um, I think I know that Landmarks has applied for some what ARPA money? Was it ARPA money mm -hmm. um, to do something we've talked about for a long, long time? with um, a revolving loan fund where you can take properties and maybe you rehab them or you find a willing buyer and when you sell the property, it goes back into the fund and it funds the next project. Um, so it it's becomes a self-perpetuating 
um, funding machine. Um, but we just don't have that in place at this point. It's something that's been discussed. The maintenance issue's been discussed, but it's, it's not anything that, that has happened. Um, maybe some city council people would like to use some of their discretionary funds to help uh, put some seed money in. That would be <coughs> nice. Because that, again, if we can keep the federal money out of it, uh, it, it reduces the amount of red tape considerably about how, how to use those funds. Well, I know for the, our garden renovation, the community garden in Oak Cloverdale, we're making it ADA accessible. They've already mm -hmm. removed all the old concrete that was all cracked and at different levels and they're gonna be pouring and bricking next. But um, I think we had $1,000 from AARP to help fund that. I think the project's coming in at 22,000 now, but it went from about 10,000 up to 22 just mm -hmm. because of the pandemic and the increase in construction costs. It's ridiculous. Well, it's like this um, Salisbury, North Carolina got a $100,000 grant from Lowe's to do that, you know, yeah. clean up maintenance, you know, community volunteer labor, um, painting and maintenance kind of project. So um, just need to find the right well, pot of money. Would the Habitat for Humanity have money that's accessible or seen or heard instead of building a new house or rebuilding a house to paint mm -hmm. a house I don't I, I don't know yeah. I know that at <coughs> least in the not too distant past and I don't know that this is still the case you know there were a couple of folks who were trying to even just donate land to them to build and that they just didn't have the capacity to keep up with all the property people were trying to give them because mm -hmm. they had a construction program. I think they were building houses out in North Pass and they hadn't built that out yet and really didn't have the capacity to, to um, take on anything else. Now that said, you know, hands on river region, you know, Maxwell folks are always looking for volunteer opportunities and they like to work. You know, so I mean, in terms of getting people who would actually kind of come and dig in and do something, um, if, if something like that was organized, I think we could get um, warm bodies there to, to do some work. Yeah, they've come to the community garden a few times. And even, you know, there was a group of us who bought a house in, in my neighborhood several years ago. I think, Carol, were you an investor? Mm -hmm. Um, because the city was going to demolish it, and it was on a corner, and it's on Madison Avenue, and it was something people were going to drive by and see a big vacant lot. And we organized, we had two volunteer days, and we had people, we had people from Cloverdale, we had people from the Garden District, because everybody was like, hey, the neighborhood's gotten together to do this. And people came, and they cut, shoot, Martin McCaffrey from the Capri came, and he's out there hacking with stereo vines. Um, you know, that if, I think if there's kind of this community purpose that I think people would rally around that kind of activity. I mean, we, we had two weekends where people were cleaning out the house, cutting back the vegetation, which was also growing up into the house, mm -hmm. and um, managed to work with the mayor's office and they sanitation. said sanitation. <laughs> no, they did that at the, the deputy mayor's direction. Sanitation came by with came a big by. claw truck, hauled off all the debris from inside the house, hauled off all the, the yard waste from outside the house. Um, so we were really able to, and had Tracy Larkin's support and financial support. Um, and it really became kind of a rallying point um, which was very pleasantly surprising, so. Well, I just remember <clears throat> attending one of the meetings on what to do with downtown. It's one of the priority things and stuff. And there was a big concern about all the vacant lots. 
and needing to infill the city. And I think that's a good place to start is by helping the people that can't help themselves for financial reasons so that it doesn't become another vacant lot and it's you know cheaper to keep and fix mm -hmm. than it is to tear it down sometimes. And sometimes, especially if you look at, if you, if you drive down Rosa Parks or, you know, parts of, of, of the streets where there have been a lot of teardowns on the west side, that doesn't tell me that that's a place I want to invest in. You know, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't speak to... Right. Um, economic opportunity unless you could get so much land you could control everything but because it just it, it starts to it's, it's like pulling the thread on a, on a sweater once you start pulling it uh, eventually you're going to be naked you know you're not gonna, you're not going to have a sweater left exactly. uh, and that's kind of what it, it looks like so you know if there's a way to stabilize um, we've discussed conservation districts, which would be kind of historic designation light, where you're looking at looking at and encouraging new construction, discouraging demolition, not looking at whether or not people are changing their windows or not, but looking at those um, streetscape kind of building relationship issues mm -hmm. to try to control and encourage certain types of activity and discourage others. Um, so that's that's another possible way to keep the sweater from unraveling too much. Well, thank you. Other questions, comments? Anyone? Christy, I'm I'm just a bit. I don't know if I want to say alarmed, but concerned about some of the things that you said. Um, the, the, the demolitions that have taken place in some of our neighborhoods, and uh, I'm just wondering, and you've asked the question, do we need to become more proactive in terms of what we do to ensure that some of these properties are not demolished? Well, I also, I wasn't going to talk about this, um, and I don't know that state law allows it. I need to look into this. Um, one of the sessions I went to was on the demolition review process, and that is something separate from historic designation, but it's where you have an ordinance that if, if, there, if demolition is proposed, that there's a review process to it where someone would determine if it's, say, a historic building, not designated, but more than 50 years old, you know, in, a, in an area that is protected or particularly sensitive for some reason, but that it's not just you can go in and, and get a demolition permit or that the city can just go and, and get approval to demolish these five addresses at this council meeting and then put it out to bid, that there's a process before you get to that point to put holds on um, demolition and um, seek out alternatives. Um, it, it seems to be a tool that people have, have put in place to um, retain more historic streetscapes and a way to not and at least this this is certainly by and large the case in Montgomery to continue to treat poor black neighborhoods as blight you know that's what got us the interstate system that's what got us urban renewal it was all blight clearance you know and it and and who who were the residents in Montgomery who suffered most from that it was, the, it was in the African-American community. So um, I need to see if state law would allow us to have some mechanism like that. Um, the, the piece of state code, which is 1153B, that allows municipalities to demolish properties, 
also allows municipalities to stabilize properties. So, oh, and also salvage from demolitions. So there, there is a provision in that repair or demolish relationship that says, okay, this, this building's important. It's got a hole in the roof. We're gonna put a new roof on it and we're gonna board up the windows. And we're gonna seal it up. And then we put a lien on it for the amount of the roof. And you know, maybe through some arrangement, the lien is forgiven if the owner decides, you know, it's heir's property, we're just gonna, we're gonna let it go. And then maybe something could be done with it. Um, so I, I don't remember anything in that, that piece of legislation that allows a review, but that doesn't mean it's not hidden somewhere else in, in the state code. I just, I don't know. But there, there is a potential tool if state law will allow it that might um, put the brakes on some things. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Question, comments? All right, we'll move on. MAPCO update. I've been told that they're gonna make one more attempt, um, but I, nothing has been submitted. So that is, that is all I know right now. Okay. All right. Is there any kind of deadline regarding? No, they're not in violation of anything. So, I mean, their, their timeline is their own. Um, I think in the last couple of months, someone may have contacted someone at, at the Cottage Hill Foundation saying they were waiting on their landscape architect to finish whatever. Um, we had gotten a call from the engineer about some other issues uh, and he had indicated that they were, he hadn't heard from them in a while either and he thought maybe it was a dead issue, but it's not. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's still, it's still hanging out there. There's a new, there's a new sign, a new, you know, for sale, commercial property sign, and it now says entire block. It has said that from the beginning. So that includes Hatton too? I, mean, I, guess, I, mean, I, I guess if the price is right, I guess the that price would be available. Right, yeah. uh -huh. um, okay. th this particular deal would only take half the block. Right. Or slightly, right. maybe two thirds of the block. Okay. Thank you. Anyone has a comment, question regarding MAPCO? All right, other business? Um, Christy Alska, isn't September 1 um, next for sign deadline. next mm -hmm. sign, next <clears throat> historic sign dot deadline will be September the 1st? And then the signs will be given out in December? Yeah, we may I have to, that's what we, I might have to do, we might need to do a rethink on this process. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I might have to get people's money up front. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Um, because, you know, the last one, someone made application, and then they put their house on the market, and then they sold it. So I've got oh. a sign that we paid for, but no one's going to pick up. So oh, that's too bad. Unless the new owner wants it. Maybe I should send him a letter and say, hey, you give me $40, I'll give you this spiffy sign to put on the front of your house. Oh, yeah, once it sells. Yeah. No, it's sold. I oh, think okay. it's sold. Oh, well, you should then. I need to, yeah. I don't know if the, ownership information has been updated yet. Okay. What neighborhood is that? Garden District. Okay. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Any other business? Any other comments, observations, whatever? Did everybody get a chance to listen to the podcast? Mm -hmm. Yes. Any comments? Mm. I found it very in informative and entertaining and I went listened to the first season as well. Yeah. So. Well, I think the casualness is what's so interesting. It doesn't look like it's hard to produce, but I'm sure it is a lot harder. Harder, and that's why we started thinking of Dr. Bailey's Monroe Street. You know, because they were talking about streets. You know, this street, that street. You know, it was very focused, just like your discussion of the businesses and the people who were on Monroe Street is so focused right there that I think it would be a, a great appeal. Yes. So. Yes, I was, I was really um, 
Let me not talk right now. Anyone else has a comment? <laughs> I'll save that for last. I, Can I just ask, how are we, if we were to do something like this, how would we publicize it? To get more community engagement? Because mm -hmm. I think it's an excellent idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How would we go about doing that? And it is bringing us like into the 21st century. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Comments? Well, we, we're, we're dealing with that on some other issues right now, too. You know, like, where does this stuff go? You know, how does this stuff get out? You know, Dallas has got a good... Um, Oh, we just use SoundCloud. No, 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 but I mean depository. <laughs> I mean, it's very, it's very accessible to the public. Right. You know, if you go to the Montgomery County the archive site, there's a lot of cool stuff on that, too. But how do you know that? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, mm -hmm. you know, where, where can it house? Mm -hmm. so. so the issue is where to house it or how to publicize it? Both. I mean, publicize oh, where it's Oh, well, housed. the publicity is super easy. You just do press releases and fire it off to WSFA and all the other media outlets. I mean, that's... Yeah, but it's getting all that done, too. So It's really not that hard. I mean... But again, and I, and I don't know what the costs are to get it on something like Spotify or, you know, but again, if you do that, then, you know, if there is a fee, then that's another grant opportunity. You know, right. we're going to do a series of podcasts, We've come up with a list of titles. We're going to do neighborhoods. We're going to talk about Monroe Street. We're going to talk about downtown business district. We're going to split that into two, and it's going to be, um, you know, Monroe Street versus Dexter Avenue, and maybe how those two, like Montgomery Fair, you know, how did that, how did that all mix together? Um, how did Crest that went through to both streets mix? Um, I mean, I think we could probably write a grant to fund some of that. Um, if Troy Public Radio had a better website, and the, you know, since they're interested, it'd be great if, if they had a place where people went to listen to podcasts. I wish you could go and listen, go back and listen to Carolyn Hutchison's, you know, 15 minute lunchtime yeah. blurbs, or, you know, not even reports, but. The, the publicity is easy though. I mean, well, you, can, right. you can hire a publicist to do that on a as needed basis. All of us are members of various professional organizations where we should be pushing it anyway. Uh, you know, Michelle, for example, with your business, you're touching a lot of different lives on a daily basis. I'm working at the county archives. You're at Landmarks. Getting it out there is not hard. And then in terms of where to put it, well, audio files get big quickly. So you would probably need to pay... I don't know, you're gonna need a lot of storage space. I mean, you could, you could do Google Drive. You could, it could be as simple as that, but you're gonna pay for it because the files are gonna get big. Well, that's just sort of the maintenance of the whole, the right. whole issue. Yeah. And other things like that too, because you know, uh, Dr. Belly, the, the tour you did, you know, that's out there someplace. It's living somewhere, we can't find it. We don't mm -hmm. know where it is. <laughs> We're looking for it right now. All right. Because that is very doable to be edited into a podcast. And, and not to mention, you know. we have a county archives that could, at the very least, act as a long-term storage opportunity. Um, you know, because this is the sort of content that archives are taking in now. Yeah, we take in papers and photographs and stuff, but it's 2022 and increasingly our, our collections are gonna be digitally based anyway, so. And again, if we can figure out what some of these costs are, I can make a budget request. I mean, worst case mm. scenario is they say no or they don't give us all the money. Um, but in the last five or six years, when I've put in for travel, I've put in for training, I've put in to pay for the awards program, nothing has ever been cut because we're not asking for an outrageous amount of money in the grand scheme of things. So, you know, we just have to if there are things that you all want to do we need to put some numbers to it so we can start putting together those budget proposals so we're ready in March or April to say hey we want to do this we're going to apply for this grant and we need X to match it um, you know we can some of this would maybe not the, the storage uh, maintenance issue but you know doing podcast recording and production I would think would be an educational component that would be eligible under the CLG grants through the Historical Commission. 
So your submission deadline is March or April for the budget? What is it? When is your submission deadline? Uh, it's, it, I'm usually asked to make sure I've got numbers together in late March, mid-April, but to mid-April. So, I mean, it's something to think about what, if, if it's something you want to pursue. So when I say you, I don't mean me, <laughs> because yeah. I'm, out there, I'm only one person. Or if it's something that we want to pursue, and we want to say, okay, part of this is going to be, you know, someone with a young brain at ASU, and we want them to be our intern that helps do the production. You know, that could be a piece of it, too. Or Huntington, or, you know, wherever. Um, so yeah. it's just something to think about. What, what pieces do we need to put in place to be able to do some of these things. So my, can I just reiterate, my question was not how exactly we were gonna get this out, but it's more or less participation. You could put it on social media or WSFA all day, but there's gotta be some type of hook. Well, what, what is your idea? So I think that we should integrate other, the arts, this is something that somebody is doing Mm -hmm. uh, if you bring in Alabama Shakespeare Festival, we're talking about historic history on Monroe Street. There could be, I don't know, I mean, there's just so many things, and I'm coming from a creative perspective, but there's so many things that we could do to make it so much more appealing when it comes down to the art, or when it comes down to the history. If you were to bring in, let's say we just bridged the gap with Shakespeare Festival, and you had your tour here on Monroe Street, why not have a street not a festival, but just a gathering in the spot like Dr. Bailey normally does with his tours, but make it more applicable to where people could come out, sit, watch, visit, but integrate your, the arts into making it more interesting, if you will. You know what I'm saying? Like when you talk about your tours or when you talk about Monroe Street, it would be great to have a reenactment or just to press people into doing more or you know showing up more um as we start archiving this history in these neighborhoods i was with um what's her name uh georgette norman the other day and when she talks about the hospitals that were on the west or the west side west on the side. west side yeah. yeah i was my interest had just peaked because i could see uh what's it um come on tell Hill. Yeah, Lake Street. Yes. 325 Lake Street. Absolutely. I was like, are you serious? And yes. so they've just put up these... a historic marker too. Yeah. So okay. to bring these characters alive, like a Bill trailer or, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, um, I get excited when, when people see it and when you put it in context. So, but my, my whole question was, how do we get the public to just yeah. show up? I couldn't you know. hear you over here. I just heard what they were, how they were responding. But yeah, yeah, no, no. But, but, I, but I thought about Bill Trailer too, and whether or not Jeffrey Wolf, the filmmaker, might be a good one to have a conversation yeah. with as a podcast. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you know someone on the HPC interviews him, and he he does the talking, but mm -hmm. he, you know someone asks the questions. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's that's the. Uh, job that we have before us. Mm -hmm. And let me give you a solid idea of what we are saying here this afternoon. About two months ago, I believe it was, Leadership Montgomery uh, brought to the city council chamber the work it had done to, shall we say, rehabilitate Remont Cemetery, mm -hmm. adjacent to Lincoln Cemetery. And I said to members of the organization after the meeting, that if someone had alerted me to what Leadership Montgomery was going to do here that day, I would have brought this significant point right. to the attention of the organization. When you talk about Remont Cemetery, mm -hmm. the person who owned Remont Cemetery, his office was right in front of us in 100 block, Monroe Street, mm -hmm. Eugene Jackson. Mm -hmm. And when I told the group that, you should have seen the goosebumps. But that's our job, to associate, to connect the dots, if you will, to let people know that history is something that took place in the past, but history is still alive. Right. And our job is to keep it alive, to give relevance to it, if you will, mm -hmm. so that people will see history is not dull. History is just as alive as we make it. Yeah. 
it is just as relevant as we make it. And our job is to make it relevant so the generation after us will become adults and applaud what we did to preserve history for them. And they, in turn, will do an excellent job of preserving history for the generation that will come after them. And what will we have? We will have nothing but gold mines all over the city, that people will look at Montgomery and smile and just applaud each generation for what that generation did to preserve the magnificence of this municipality. This is what we're talking about, connecting all of this so people can see that we do have something here to be very proud of. And, and I will tell you, I haven't seen anything yet appealing about a vacant lot. And I would challenge someone to show me what is appealing about a vacant lot. I know you demolish a building, you demolish a house to create that vacant lot, but what is appealing about the vacant lot? Not one thing. That's exactly right. So this is our task. This is our job to let people know, as we say, or try to say at the closing of our meeting, there are alternatives to demolishing something. And when one person uh, said how people in the neighborhood get some paint and put on something, we can do that. A building do doesn't deteriorate overnight. It's a daily process. And all we have to do is to arrest that deterioration. Right. Show interest in beautifying our neighborhoods, cleaning up our streets, if you will, and letting people know that house over there, who lived in that house at one point, how prominent that family was. That's our job. Any other business? So, Christy, let's, uh, from this angle, thank you for the po podcast. Uh, hearing about Biddy Mason, I've talked to people in Los Angeles, and you'd be surprised how many people have never heard of Biddy Mason who live in Los Angeles. Madam C.J. Walker, the Cummings uh, community, and all of that, thank you so much for bringing those podcasts to our attention and bring some more. Well, uh, I, would, I would suggest that you all think about stories or places that are worth telling the story of. You know, Lanier High School is going to be closed. You yes. know, that, that has been, meant something in this community for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to Michelle's point about how do, you, how do you bridge and make connections with other organizations? You know, what's, what, what are those relationships and bridges that can be built to try to make this more than just something you hope someone will find on the internet? Um, I think it's interesting, personally, that, you know, for, you know, since the beginning of time, people have, that storytelling has been an oral tradition, and then, you know, now, now we, then you go to school and you read books that, that podcasts have, have just taken such a hold that that aspect of storytelling and passing on that knowledge in, in a, in a, in an oral tradition is like, we're, we're coming back to the roots of our humanity of how we have always shared things with one another. Um, and I, I think that it, it is something that, that the young, younger generations gravitate to and seem to really enjoy. You get it in 20 and 30 minute snippets and at least, you know, it's, it's, a, it's the length of a sitcom, but get, if you can hold their attention, you're going to get the, the message across, so. Okay, any other business? Any other business? Anyone um, has anything? I have Come, a yes. comment. Yes. When you said about Lanier High School closing, is it, it's closing because it's in desperate need of repairs. Is it any funding that's available to repair it? Uh, for the for MPS, 
Um, well, it's a historical landmark. Oh, I know it is. Um, I don't possibly. Brick and mortar money is hard to find. Um, it would be easier for a developer to put together tax credits um, where they could defray probably 40 to 50% of their costs on the rehab um, easier than it would be to find grant funds that can address a lot of deferred maintenance. But, but that would be for another use. Yeah, for, not a, for, for a different it would be use. Something else, not, yeah. linear, not a high school anymore. I mean, I mean, it, and I, mean, I think it's probably in an opportunity zone. So, I mean, there, right. there, are, there, there's funding that's a chance. for the private market that's probably more readily available than for an institutional use. That's not to say there isn't any, because, you know, certainly other school systems have revamped, Lanier's awfully big, um, have, there was a school in, um, Columbia, South Carolina that was closed and they were going to turn it into elder housing and that didn't work out and they ended up renovating it it became like the the high-tech high school of course this was 20 years ago so high-tech meant it had you know internet, internet. <laughs> <laughs> so, <coughs> um, so, sometimes it, it just takes creativity on putting together different financing to do it but Lanier is a very large building. Um, so, that'd be a big pot of money. I don't know. Okay. Can I just add one Yes, ma'am, please. You mentioned the podcast. Can we add YouTube channel onto that? Sure. Uh, that's what, that's where Doc Bailey needs to be, too. Yeah. Because he needs to be seen. Yeah. And her. <laughs> Thank you. Too. Anybody has anything coming up you'd like to bring to our attention? Any yes. Event? Yes. Yes. So the Montgomery County Archives is part of a three-year grant project funded by the National Archives um, to locate and digitize and make available online antebellum legal records that mention enslaved people. And the other partners include the <laughs> University of Mississippi, Mississippi State University, Delta State University, the Columbus Lounge Public Library, and the H Historic Natchez Foundation. And the project is called The Lantern Project, with the idea of shedding light on these individuals that are hiding in plain sight in local legal records across the southeast. And we're coming to the end of that project. The database is publicly available online, um, but we, the partner institutions, are beginning to host informational sessions on what the project is and how to use the Lantern Project database. And on August 30th, beginning at 9 a.m. in the County Commission Chambers here in Montgomery, I'll be hosting a, one of these informational sessions. Um, we ask that you go on the county website to register. Registration is free. We just need to have a head count so that um, we have enough handouts. Um, and if you can't attend in person, the event will be live streamed on the county YouTube and Facebook page. And all that is also on the online announcement on the county website. So I urge you to come out um, and, and attend. Can you give us a telephone number for someone who just might want to give you a call? Absolutely. 334-832-7173. Okay, thank you so much. Anyone has, has something coming up you want to bring to our attention? Anyone? Okay, Chrissy, we also want to thank you for um, your history bits uh, on this day. I, I was feeling a little squirrely again when I wrote this. The, the, the page seemed too blank, so I was just trying to look for things. But just, just as a point, Robert Fulton failed. You know, his boat sank. So, yes, yes. Um, and yet, he still came up with a paddle boat that worked. Yes, yes. Very significant name in, in, in our history uh, chronology. And then the, the point on the elevator. Uh, we got an Otis elevator in our yeah, building. Yeah, 56 yeah, so that's years That's a name later. we see every day. Yes. Yeah. Yes, people, people might want to know these things, and um, we want to just thank you for doing that. And we also want to thank you, Christy Anderson and Ms. Javon Hines, for taking time out from your busy schedule. You've been here all day to uh, 
uh, stay with us and Dennis Potter from uh, security and uh, our man with the videography. I want to thank him too. Uh, he's always over here. And to our other commissioners, I want to thank you all for coming up. That being no further business, this meeting is hereby adjourned.